Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to consider for ourselves is found recorded for us in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, let's hi highlight for ourselves verses 13 through 18. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. As far as God's word lets you and I continue to pray. O oh, gracious and merciful Father, again, how awesome it is that we get to hear about your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and what it is that he has done for us. Lord, help us to wrestle with the words of our text, to come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and to firmly and surely believe that because of him, heaven is our home. In Jesus we pray, amen. So, in our Bible classes, in our Bible classes on Monday night and on Wednesday mornings, we have been studying the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to tell you, it's a marvelous book. Really, it's an epistle. Now, the book of Hebrews was written to Jews and Jewish Christians to help them grasp that the original Jewish faith was really the same faith that the Christians had but now was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So you can well imagine that the images that are found in the book of Hebrews are really taken from the rituals found in the Jewish worship life, you know, the ones that are revealed in the Old Testament, and then it is explained how Jesus fulfilled those shadows. So take, for instance, the opening verse of our epistle lesson for this morning, verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That line is referring to the numerous animal sacrifices that were made all the time at the temple. Had been since the temple and tabernacle had been established, even to the day of Jesus. You have to understand, at the temple, even the day started with a sacrifice, and the day ended with a sacrifice. And then, as the people came to worship, it was sacrifice after sacrifice that was brought to the temple. Blood, and the smell of burning meat and fat, that was what you found at the temple. But notice what this verse points out. The priests were doing their duty as God had commanded them, but evidently what they were doing was not sufficient for the cause. It was shown not sufficient because it had to be done again and again. And the illustration that I'll use for you is really quite simple. I'll put the lesson this way. If I have a leaky toilet and I go in and I fix it, every hour of every day, and it still leaks, then I have not fixed the toilet. Although it's not said directly in this particular section of Hebrews, do be aware of the fact that it is clearly taught in the book of Hebrews that the sacrifices were not the thing. Actually, it's taught in the Old Testament too. The sacrifices were there to point to to remind you of, to symbolize the thing that was important, namely, that one day, the one sacrifice that God had promised would come, and when that sacrifice was made, all the other sacrifices could be stopped because they would become useless and worthless. In other words, it was not the sacrifice itself, but what the sacrifice pointed to that counted, namely, the Christ, the Son of God. And that truth is found reference for us in verse 12. But when this priest, and if you want to know who this priest is, just listen to what is said. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, 
he sat down at the right hand of God. Well, that's a reference to Jesus, the Christ. Jesus is the great high priest who, you know, the great high priest of all of time, who came and who made that one sacrifice that truly counted. The sacrifice was himself. Jesus offered himself on the cross, and that one sacrifice for sin made all sin paid for. In other words, Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, the Savior from sin, the promised Messiah of God, who brings a message of wonder and joy to all of mankind. And that, dear people, is what we're going to focus on for today. Our theme, forgiven in Jesus. Now, I pray that you do indeed recognize that it is Jesus that our text is talking about. Who else has made that one sacrifice? Who else has ascended to the throne of God and sits at the right hand of God? Again, you just recognize that, that when we sit back and look at the history of Jesus, when we see what this text says, that well, that should seal the deal in understanding this is about Jesus. And what I totally love about this section of Hebrews is that it clearly and wonderfully tells us exactly what Jesus has done for us. That's the point of verse 14. And that verse says this, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Notice how this echoes something that was said beforehand, that it was one sacrifice that did it all, that one sacrifice was Jesus Christ on the cross suffering and dying for us. And the end result of that one sacrificial death of Jesus is he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, I have to tell you that I really don't like this translation. The Greek text would actually be translated, he has made perfect those who are being sanctified. And I want you to know that's how the new EHV, the Evangelical Heritage Version that our synod is uh, putting out, it translates that verse. And really, here's the wider meaning of this word. Now, this word is really a word that can mean to be made holy at its base, but in this particular case, it's a word that is telling us of God's work. God has called us out of unbelief to faith. God is making us holy because we have been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. You know, the perfect Jesus. This passage is a reference to those who have faith. Believers in Jesus are the ones who receive the benefits of Jesus, who get clothed with his righteousness, who are declared holy and perfect because Jesus was holy and perfect for us. In other words, it's a wonderful proclamation of God's word. It's the whole point of God's word. Yet, please note that the author of the book of Hebrews is not content to just let it be his word or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here in this matter. The author now appeals to the Old Testament, the true and inspired message of God given to and through the Jewish people. Please note that the Old Testament is just as true, just as inspired, just as fully God's word as the New Testament is. For that matter, it's Jesus who points out in connection to the Holy Spirit, points out to us in John chapter 5, these are the scriptures that testify about me. And that's exactly where Hebrews takes us, to hear God's Holy Spirit himself proclaim the wonder of Jesus. So verses 15 and 16 say, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. This passage is telling us that when Jesus comes because of what Jesus will do, things are going to be different. We are going to be different. God will change us. God will declare us his children and heirs of eternal life. And what is it that children are concerned with? Children are concerned with pleasing their parents because of the love of their parents. The new covenant, which is the message of the New Testament, is, is uh, you know, and that New Testament is about Jesus, the New Testament is because of Jesus, you recognize that then things between God and man 
are going to be different. Well, let me share with you some passages that point this truth out to us, that things are going to be different. So, for instance, when the apostles were arrested and they were put in prison for the message of Jesus, preaching and teaching the message of Jesus, here is what happened and what they were told. This is from Acts chapter 5. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full news of this new life. In one of the beautiful passages that shows the connection between Jesus and us, we're told these words, and this is taken from Romans chapter 6. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. In another epistle verse, this simple message was shared. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Again, the lesson of the prophecy, this, this prophecy that's found for us in Jeremiah, that lesson is proclaimed loudly when in Ephesians chapter 4 we hear this. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And finally, one of my favorites taken for us from 1 John chapter 3, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Now, you, you might wonder why I quoted so many passages. It's done simply to show you that what was prophesied in Jeremiah about the work of Christ, the work of Christ has been and is fulfilled. It's clear. That's the message of the New Testament. But there's also another reason to do this. Unfortunately, because of many modern-day churches and liberalism, there are many Christians who ignore that we are to be new creatures. Creatures who desire and strive and love to do their best in following Jesus. Now, I'll admit, dear people, we're lousy at we're, we're lousy at following Jesus. We stumble and fall. We sin in thought, word, and deed on a regular basis. But that's because of the toll that sin has taken on us. We, we are enemies of God by nature and inclined to evil. Yet all the while, as we are lost in sin, here's the difference. As Christians, we struggle and we battle. We strive for what's good and right. Our attitude is that Jesus is that in Jesus we hate sin and we desire to do what is good. And by the way, that's the narrow meaning of the word sanctified. We, in other words, do want to do what is good even though we struggle so hard. And we do. And when that attitude, that battle, that fight, that struggle is a part of your life, when that newness of life is what drives you, that's what counts. But when that newness of life in Jesus is missing from your life, then I fear that perhaps the call of faith, perhaps belief in Jesus is either weakened or it's non-existence. And, and that's when we're called upon by God's word to repent and turn again to the wonder and the joy of Jesus. And what is awesome is that our passage shows exactly why we are new creatures, why we have a different attitude than the world. Listen, if you would, to verses 17 and 18. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. <coughs> the whole key to this is to grasp and understand the forgiveness of sins. It is the gift of Jesus. 
It is the declaration that we have been made perfect forever. We are counted as perfect before God because Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, has called us to faith. In that faith, we grasp the forgiveness of sins, and it's ours in Jesus. And it is that message, that wonderful, that sweet, that eternal message of our Savior that melts our hearts and leads us to service to Him, not because we have to, but because we can't help ourselves as the children of God and as new creatures of heaven. Do you get that? Jesus, the work of Jesus is about our forgiveness and eternal life. This forgiveness is true whether you believe it or not. It's true because it is an act and it is a declaration of God. God in Jesus has declared all sins are forgiven. Now, if you refuse to believe that message, if you refuse to believe the wonder of Jesus, then I'm going to tell you point blank, there will be a problem. Because this forgiveness is ours only in faith. That is the one limitation that God has put on it. Faith in Jesus is required. If you disown Jesus, if you reject Jesus, then this forgiveness is also something that you reject. And now, you're going to have to stand before God on your own. You're going to have to face God alone. And you're going to have to try and explain to Him why you are not completely and perfectly holy. But dear people, when you have Jesus, when you have faith in Jesus, you know, that message of God, all sins are forgiven, that becomes your message, our, our message. In Jesus, because of Jesus, in, you know, because of faith in Jesus, we hear God proclaim to us, Terry, your sins are forgiven. And I'm telling you that every single one of you who believes in Jesus, you can insert your name into that sentence. And you can fully and truly understand my sins are forgiven in Jesus. That's the very point, that's the very power of our Jesus and the faith that he has called us to. Now, do, do you grasp the point of that last part of our text? And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. That's a sentence to remind you of the all-sufficient nature of what Jesus has done. His sacrifice was complete. His atonement, his paying for our sins was so thorough and so perfect that no other sacrifice for sins need to, needs to be made. It's a reminder to find in Jesus complete atonement and salvation. To rely on Jesus and his work alone. You see, you and I aren't responsible for somehow earning this salvation. And, and again, I tell you that because there are so many churches out there that tell you, you must, you must do this or do that in order to be saved. For instance, you must be a witness. Or you must give a tithe, you know, your 10%. Or you must be baptized to show your love. You must surrender yourself to Christ. You know, I have received Jesus into my heart. Or you must obey Christ. You must, you must, you must. And those must in many churches just go on and on and on. But dear people, in Jesus there are no must. In Jesus there is forgiveness and eternal life. And Jesus, because of his call to faith, there is new life. And it's not a must kind of thing. It's just something that is. And I'll use my favorite illustration here. Again, we were dead sticks laying on the ground. Dead sticks falling out of the tree. We should have been picked up and thrown into the fire. But we were dead sticks. And God picks us up in Jesus and plants us and gives us life. 
And he then turns us into fruit trees that bear fruit to his glory. And God has done all of this for us in Jesus. There it is. The wonder of Jesus. The wonder of his forgiveness and his gift of eternal life. And I pray that you may simply hear and believe. May you be sure and secure in the power of Jesus, the power and the completeness of his forgiveness for you. Amen.